end time explosions of truth with Apostle Takim. It's been said, if you want to get married, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to get married, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if you want to be free from any work of the devil, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to be free from every work of the devil, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if things are not okay with you, it's your foundation that is responsible or some altars in your village. But God has sent his teaching prophet to tell us, if things are not okay with you, it is the foundation of the Lord that is missing in your life. The Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi presents Moment of Grace and Truth, the prophetic and apostolic teaching ministry of Richard E. Esther King. We cannot stop screaming the rumblings of the Holy Ghost to the ears of our generation. Now, follow us to the sanctuary. The Bible says in verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, tell your neighbor, say, but you. Be watchful in all days. I didn't hear you. Look at the next word. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And let me add this without doing damage to the scripture. Fulfill your calling as a child of God. Fulfill your calling as a child of God. How is your calling fulfilled? It is when you close your eyes and you wake up in the arms of Jesus. And he tells you, welcome that good and faithful servant. That is when your calling has been fulfilled. Until that happens, you must keep running this race. And not looking at the face of the devil. And not responding to the flesh or the things of the devil. You must keep running this race. We will not stop. You must keep running. Is a description of people that will never make it. Look at Galatians chapter 5. How it describes people that will never go to the heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident. Which are what? Adultery. I hope there will be time. To, I want to pick some things that we are people are trapped in. Some things that people are trapped in. What did he say? Adultery. I'll just pick some things here and talk about them. He said, which are adultery, fornication. Number two, fornication. What the world call fun. They have, they have changed it to fun. The Bible calls it fornication. He now said uncleanness, licentiousness. Uncleanness, I told you, if you are uh, smoking and you think you are going to heaven, sorry, I'm so sorry, you can't go. Do you, do you understand me? It's not this heaven that Jesus went to prepare that you will go with sticks of cigarette in your mouth. Mm -mm. It's not that one. Because there is no angel that is smoking there. Are you, are you understanding me? The only thing they smoke there is God's glory. That is what they, they breathe it in and they breathe it out. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So the Bible now says licentiousness, which is part of sexual immorality, making use of the grace of God to live in sexual sin. Idolatry, having, I mean, placing things in your life higher than God. You place your job higher than God. You place the, the, the grave for comfort higher than God. You place your parents higher than God. Anything you place higher than God makes you an idolater and help heaven. Is, is not the home of idolaters. Sorcery. Look at the next statement. Hatred. Tell me hatred. Contentions. Jealousies. Adverse of wrath. Selfish ambitions. That's another thing I want to touch. Selfish ambitions. Are you understanding me? Now he now went on to say to say dissensions, heresies, that's another thing I want to touch. Heresies. Do you see people who have this character? Look at what the Bible says. It says envy, murders, drunkenness. Show me drunkenness. There's no space for me to write that. There are preachers who believe that if you drink, take alcohol, you will not go to hell. You will go to heaven. Some of them take it before preaching. They take, or take it after. 
You get my point? There are churches who believe taking alcohol is not a problem. You can just drink it. Nothing will happen. Jesus turned water to wine and they don't go and check which of the wines. Do you understand me? God will not be against alcohol and turn water into alcohol. Man may do that but not God. Are you understanding me? The book of Proverbs made it very clear that give wine to he that want to perish. So if you want to go to hell, go and take the bottles. Drunkenness, you cannot be, you see, you cannot be taking alcohol and go to a heaven that people that are there are not taking alcohol. You know, say rivalries, parties, and social functions that does not glorify God. You get my point? Every funeral you are there, every bad day you are there, even no matter what, whoever is celebrating, whatever you are there, don't know that when the wicked celebrate their bad day, heavens rumbles. May God help us. He said, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not do what? will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to define the word adultery and fornication and selfish ambition and heresy. Now, let me begin with heresies. Heresies is half-truth or outright lies. Half-truth or outright lies. When a preacher is preaching half-truth or outright lies, when he dies, he's not going to heaven. Do you understand me? When a Christian believes in half truth or outright lies, when you die, you're not going to heaven. So in the light of this, everybody who imbibe the gospel of the kind of deliverance we have today, all the lies they preach on the pulpit, that you are suffering because you're firstborn, that you must give the first salary of the year for God to bless you, and all these kind of lies, money-making lies that they tell is part of heresies. Are you understanding me? Nobody, in fact, the most dangerous heresy is the heresy about grace. The sin you, you are committing yesterday, God has forgiven you. The one you will commit, he will also forgive you. And they kill your sense of divine conviction. So heresies and people trapped in it cannot make heaven. Selfish ambition, if you are not pushing the will of God on earth, if you are doing your own will, if you are using God to validate your will, or you, the Bible says you are selfish. Are you understanding me? So if you are trapped in selfish ambitions, you are, going, you are not going to the heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare. If you are involved in fornication, what is fornication? It's sexual relationship between two unmarried people or between or let me say when an unmarried person gets involved in sexual relationship that person is a fornicator she may be sleeping with a married man or someone who is not married or a married woman or someone who is not married you are a fornicator are you understanding me and there is no fornicator that will make heaven or you are living with a man you are not sleeping with so many you are just sleeping with one you are with him in the same house you people are not married you are just cohabitation cohabitating you may not like what i'm saying this morning the bible calls you a fornicator are you understanding me because you are just cohabitating you are not married you could be bearing children the bible calls them children of fornication i want to tell you the truth you may not like what i'm saying you may not believe in it if you close your eye in death heaven will not be your home that is why in this church we teach those who are cohabitating to go and marry properly pay bright price come to church let's bless your marriage get things done properly because hell is hot do you understand me hell is hot you are fornicating then what is adultery if you read from the amplified version the very scripture in luke chapter 16 verse 18 look at how god defined adultery how jesus the judge of all define adultery Luke chapter 16 we all know it is sexual relationship between a married person and a married person or a married person and a single person any married person involved in sexual relationship 
outside his marital vows, that person is an adulterer. If he closes his eye in death, he's not going to make heaven. He could be a bishop, he could be a pastor, he could be an apostle, wherever he is. That is what the Bible says. It's not what me I'm saying. Luke 16. Are we all there? Verse 18. Look at what it says. It says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Galatians chapter 6 now says what? Chapter 5 now says what? The adulterer will not make heaven. So what is the meaning of whoever divorces his wife? Let's define who is a wife. He did not say whoever divorced a woman. Do you understand me? He did not say whoever divorced a woman. Because if you are not married, if, if you are cohabitating, whoever you are living with is not a wife, it's just a woman. So the word divorce does not come in because the word divorce is used for people who are legally, legitimately, and properly married. Are you understanding me? You are legally, you are legitimately, you are properly married. And every Christian understands the word proper marriage. Do you understand me? So the Bible is saying if you are legitimately and properly married to, to someone, you are not expected to improperly divorce the person and what's the meaning of divorce amplified gave us two descriptions number one he said dismiss so me dismiss now when you cannot just wake up you are married to this woman or this man properly proper marriage you get my point not improper i'm not talking about cohabitating I'm not talking about just crossing and living together. I'm talking about properly married. We know proper marriage. There have to be the will of God in it. There have to be a wedding. There have to be pain of bright pride. There have to be everything ordained of God. That is proper marriage. Now you cannot wake up one morning and dismiss either the man or the woman and jump to another person the bible says you are an adulterer when you close your eyes in death you cannot make he heaven so amplified cause is dismissed so me dismiss jesus said in matthew 19 that nobody is expected to put away his wife as or a woman is expected to put away her husband except for adultery except for sexual sin or any form of treachery you get my point there are biblical boundaries for dealing with those issues in marriages so jesus said if there's no grievous thing that has happened then you are not expected to dismiss so if you dismiss your spouse you may be living in the same house properly married but you are dismissed. This one is sleeping in room A. The other one is sleeping in room B. If two of you die, you are going to hell. That's what the Bible says. I was told of a couple, properly married, blessed with their children, but they have dismissed themselves in the marriage out of just conflict, little conflict in the house. Not that anybody has committed adultery or anybody has brought any woman or man to the house. They're just disagreements. So this one now said living in the other room. The other one living in the other room. Each time this one travels, this one will be praying that the person dies so I marry another person. If this one travels, this one will be praying. And I told the person who told me, if I were their pastors, I will kill everything. Because you guys are not murderers. So Kuku dismiss, go home and leave. Stay single till you die. Do you understand my point? You see, they have wrongly dismissed themselves. And the funny thing is that there were elders in the church. The wife was a deaconess. The husband was a deacon. So anytime he stands on the altar to give announcements or do his deacon duty, the woman will be cursing him in, in her heart. And anytime the woman also stands on the altar, he will be cursing her in the heart. Those people are no longer Christians. They are hell candidates that have been prepared for hell in the church. Are you understanding me? Look at the net word I got from the Amplified. What does it mean? Write the word repudiate. Repudiate. R U E P U D I A T E. Repudiate. We are looking at the biblical description. <coughs> People that will not make heaven if they close their eyes in death. Are you understanding me? The biblical description. Tell me repudiate. 
What does it mean to repudiate? Right? is that number one. To refuse to accept. So, if you are properly and legally married to someone and you now refuse to accept the person after a while of marriage based on disagreement that are not grievous like i said we know things that the bible is talking about so disagreements that are not grievous things that are just minor you see you see there are men that <coughs> just re refuse to accept their wives <coughs> because maybe to them she's no longer beautiful but she was beautiful the day you wedded she was beautiful when you went to pay the bride price. You get my point? But now she's no longer. And you start at, bring, bring her something, spending time with other women, spending time with other women and sleeping with them and coming back. You are on your path to hell. That's what the Bible says. He now says reject. To, it means to reject. It also means to renounce. Do you understand me? It means to give up, to turn one's back on. To have nothing more to do with or deny the truth of validity of. There was somebody I met one time. He told me, <clears throat> let me check my wife if she's sleeping with her boss. I said, how? He said, you're a prophet. I'm going to bring her. Look at her. I said, no, I'm not a sorcerer. You get my point? And the next thing was, why are you having these misgivings? Oh, he gave me his reasons. And I asked him, do you marry properly? He said, yes. We did that. We cut it with this and this. And our pastor, and I know the pastor, one of the big guys in our nation, where that was. And I said, now what's the problem? He started denying the validity of the process they went through. Whenever a man or a woman want to do wickedness, they will deny the truth. Do you understand me? They will deny the truth. Jesus is saying, if you are properly married, it's not cohabitation. If you are properly married, he leaves you and he gives you a husband or he gives you a wife and you one day get up, reject the person, renounce the person, give up on the person, turn your back, have nothing more to do with the person or deny the truth that Jesus gave you the person. He said, when you close your eyes in death, you are not going to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Are you understanding me? Am I still your friend this morning? Now, let me show you. Somebody may sit down there and say, this pastor is condemning us. He's judging us. I want to show you Bible warning to such intelligent fools. You get my point? I'm not the one that called them intelligent fools. It's the Bible that called them intelligent fools. Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I want you to get this straight. It used, I have heard people quote second corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 and they describe teachings like what you're hearing this morning warnings like what you're hearing this morning they describe them as condemning people ministry of condemnation but let's look at what is the real ministry of condemnation what is the judgment of god on these intelligent fools look at second corinthians chapter 3 quickly second corinthians chapter 3 God wants to set our lives straight because he wants to have all of us in heaven. Are you understanding me? The greatest accomplishment in the life of a human being is when you die and you end in the hands of Jesus. That's the greatest accomplishment. Paul said, he said, he said there is no layoff for me. He said, I have run the race. I have finished my course. Now there is layoff for me, the crown. Do you understand me? So that is the greatest accomplishment. It's not when you have a PhD. It's when you end in the hands of Jesus. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 7. The Bible says. But if the ministry of death. Written and engraved on stones was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses. Because of the glory of his countenance. Which glory was passing away. What it does the Bible mean? Everything in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, and what Moses did, the Bible called it the ministry of death. 
and yet it has the glory of God in it. Why did he call the minister of death? He was simply saying they could warn about hell, if I may use that word, or they could warn about sin, and they could warn about living a righteous life, or encourage people to live a righteous life. He said, but they have no power to impart them. You get my point? There was no power. Moses could stand and say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, but there's no anointing to transform the thief and stop him from stealing. Do you understand me? So as a result, it was a ministry of death. It was not transmitting life into people. That is why it's called the ministry of death. That is why you see God saying, I will make a new covenant with them. I will put my spirit in them. And I will write my law in their hearts. That becomes a ministry of life. Are you understanding me? So in another world, what is the ministry of death today? Any preaching that is not impacting you with the life of God to live holy is a ministry of death. Do you understand me? Is, are there churches on ground today that when you sit down or you attend the service, you, you will not even know what is holiness? Talk to me. Do we have them on ground? Are there ministers that when they finish preaching, the, 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 the power to, stay, to say no to sin cannot be imparted to you? That is a ministry of death. So a, the ministry of death is not a, a minister that tells you live right. When you do this, you go to hell. When you do that, you go to heaven. That is a ministry of righteousness. It's a ministry of life. If it's imparting you with the strength to say no to sin, but any church or minister who is not imparting with the energy to say no to sin, that is a ministry of death. I remember one lady sent me a message. She worships in the church. Oh, she, I asked her, how, was, how is it? Because of her message. Oh, it's very powerful. Our bishop preaches very well. But the problem I'm having, I have had issues with sexual passions all my years i've been worshiping there and and when i heard you and i said let me call you for help and i said why didn't you call your bishop for help i have my own people i'm taking care of why is it that you you, you say the place is powerful the place they preach very well and yet their preaching have not saved you from sexual sins that is a ministry of death do you understand me that is the ministry of death to make the matters worse. The bishop that he tells me preach powerfully, want to sleep with her. You see the way Christians deceive themselves. And yet she say he preaches well. So what is the preaching? So the impact of the word is what is what the Bible is talking about. It said, by their fruit we shall know them. So if the word that is being preached is not stirring up righteousness and giving the strength to say no to sin, that is the ministry of death. Do you understand me? Look at what the Bible says. It said, how would the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? So any ministry that imparts you to live right is the ministry of the spirit. Do you understand me? Verse 9 says, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exists more in glory. What is the ministry of condemnation? Is that ministry of the Old Testament. That, is not in, that was not injecting life in the people. It could not transform a liar. It could not transform a thief. That is a ministry of condemnation. So the ministry of condemnation is not looking at a thief and calling him a thief. He's not looking at an adulterer and calling the person you an adulterer. He's not looking at a gay and say, hey, you are a gay. You will go to hell if you die in gay. You better repent. You see, it is the intelligent fools that cause such condemnation. You are not condemning because they are already condemned. You are opening their eyes to see where they will go if they die. Do you understand me? So when uh, somebody says, don't condemn, tell the person you are condemned already. So I'm not condemned. Condemn me. I'm opening your eyes to see where you would where, where you would drop if you close your eyes in death. How many of you are understanding me here this morning? So the Bible now went on to say that for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excelled for if what was passing away was glorious what remains is more glorious therefore since we have such hope we use great boldness of speech unlike moses 
who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away but their minds were hardened for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the Old Testament because the veil is taken away we are in Christ so the ministry of righteousness takes away veils it breaks a hardened heart. Some of you were having hardened heart. You were hard in sin. You were hard. You sold yourself to sin. But when you step into this ministry, God begins to break your heart and break that hardness of heart. And today you have renounced the hidden works of shame because you are now under the ministry of righteousness. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So the ministry of condemnation is not a ministry that I call a spade a spade. Are you understanding me? It's a ministry that does not transmit the life of God in people. It condemns them. Can I go deeper on that statement? When a preacher who is preaching uh, Jesus sleeps with a woman and seal her damnation, he has condemned her to eternal damnation. Do you know many people are not in church because of what pastors did with them? I'm not talking about the wicked who lie against preachers. I'm talking about people who were abused and dropped. You got my point? The person slept with you. He says, he's going to marry you. I collected your money. You gave your car. You gave your land. You gave everything. And one day, after he has soaked all the juice because you were stupid. Can, can you imagine? A woman gave her money, gave her car, gave everything, gave her sexuality. Stupid. Why can't you give the car and leave your sexuality? And leave your body intact? But you gave everything, including the body. So the man soak everything, soak the money, soak the body, and not drop you and go. Such a woman, you will need encounter with Jesus to still believe that they are righteous men of God. Do you understand me? So, so the life of that person has been sealed. That is a ministry of condemnation. In fact, it's actually a ministry of hypocrisy. Let's go forward. I want to show you three things, then we close. Number one, the ultimate condition for making heaven. What's the ultimate condition for making heaven? It's not just joining a church. It's not just reciting the sinner's prayer. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Hallelujah to Jesus. We must all go home and go and sit down and reflect on the word of the Lord this moment. Are you understanding me? Colossians 1 verse 26. It said the mystery which have been hidden from ages and from generations may now have been revealed to his saints. Hallelujah. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which was the mystery? Which is Christ in you. The hope of what? Glory. Christ in you. So the ultimate condition for making heaven is not a recitation of sinner's prayer. It's Christ in you. Is Christ in you. That is the ultimate con condition for making heaven. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Look at how 1 John chapter 5 further explained it to us. 1 John chapter 5 verse 11. Look at what it says. 1 John chapter 5 verse 11. It says, and this is the testimony that God has given us what? Eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. He who has the son has what? Has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Because I've heard Christians who quote this scripture and they impute it upon themselves that since they are in church, they have life. But if you look at the lifestyles, you don't see the life. Do you understand me? He said, he who has a son has life. That means you will see a new life. If Christ is in you, it shows in the lifestyle. That's what the Bible is saying here. If you're a liar, you no longer lie. If you're a thief, no longer thief. If you're a fornicator, you're no longer fornicate. If you were involved in anything, as soon as he enters, you leave it. 
Where do you go to on Sunday mornings? Do you sit at home or worship in a money-making machine or spiritually dead assembly called church? Join us every Sunday. First service, 8.30 a.m. Second service, 12.30 p.m. Inside food. Revolutionary and life-giving. Full of the precious power of the Holy Spirit. As God's servant, Richard E. Esther Kim, author of Riding on Covenant Wings, Overcoming Witchcraft by the Greatness of God's Power, and You Shall Not Be Poor, unfolds the Word of Truth and Righteousness under the propelling force of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. He who has the Son has life. Now, in I say, he who does not have the son, how do you know? He does not have life. So when, so, when Christ is in you, it shows in your character. But if you claim that Christ is in you, your, and, and your character is not showing us, that, is a, that means it's not in you. So the ultimate condition for making heaven is what? Christ in you. The Bible says, if anyone be in Christ... Is a new creature. Now, we first of all come into Christ. As we come into Christ, He enters us and creates a new life within us. So, when that new life is created within you, you begin to live a heavenly life on earth. The ultimate condition for making the heaven is Christ in you. If he has entered you, it will show in your character. Number two, I want, to, I want to give you what I call the big questions to ask ourselves. The big question to ask ourselves. Who is living in me? Can you ask yourself that question with me? Who is living in me? Ask at most strength to that. At most strength to that. Because if the ultimate condition for going to heaven is Christ living in me, so it's very important that I always ask myself, maybe on daily basis, who is living in me? Because Christ in me, the hope of glory. Who is not living in me? Now, there are four other questions that will help you understand this question. Number one, write this down. Whoever lives in you will be the one driving you. Whoever lives in you will be the one what? Driving you in life. Whoever lives in you will be the one driving you. Let me tell you something. In the church today, we take pride in our cars that we drive. We take pride in the things we drive. But the most important thing is not what you are driving. It is who is driving you. That's the most important thing in life. It's, it's not the kind of car you drive. No, it's the kind of spirit driving you. You may drive the best car on earth, but what is driving you is an unclean spirit. And I want to show you the signs that you can use to check yourself when what is driving you is not Christ. I will go back to the book of Proverbs that we read. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 16. How do you know if what is driving you is not Christ? Proverbs 6 16. These six things the Lord has. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. How do you know that what is driving you is not Christ? Number one, a proud look. This is time to check yourself. Do you have a proud look? How do you look at people? How do you look at things? Two, a lying tongue. When an unclean spirit is driving you, it shows in your tongue. The first one is attitude. It shows in your attitude. The second way it shows, it shows in your tongue. Mm. It's quiet now. Very quiet today. The, the, the thought where you know, hands that shed innocent blood. So, if what is driving you is not Christ, it will show in your relationship. Hands have to do with relationship. Do you understand me? It will show in the kinds of people around you. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Yes, huh? Number eight, number eighteen. He said, "A heart 
that defies wicked plans, that devises wicked plans. So if Christ, if what is driving you is not Christ, it's time you are alone, you produce what the Bible calls vain imaginations. You can devise wicked things in your heart. You can strip somebody who is not naked. To you, you are seeing him naked. What is driving you is not Christ. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You get my point? What's driving you is not Christ. It's an unclean spirit driving you. So if you close your eyes in death, you cannot make heaven. Please be told the truth. Are you understanding me? The Bible says they have devised wicked schemes. There are people that can plan any wicked thing. As soon as a teenager gets pregnant and the person is panicking and comes to them, they will say, Don't worry, I will advise you. They know which drug to take. They are very foolish in everything, but not in doing wickedness. When it comes to aborting of children, they are professors. They know what drug to take, what to do to kill that unborn generation. Had that device wicked plans. They know how to plan. You see, there are people who are foolish in doing the right thing, but intelligent in doing the wicked thing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? They are very intelligent. They can lie in such a way. Have you ever seen a Dundee, a fool, who can lie intelligently? What is driving the person is a demon. It's not Christ. Had that device wicked plans, he now said, Feet that are swift in running to evil. That is a sign that what is driving you is not Christ. Number 19, he said, A false witness who speak lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So, when somebody is sowing discord, Christ is not in the person. What is driving that person is an unclean spirit. Are you understanding me? Sad enough, you can see the description in the church sad enough so the second question to ask yourself to be able to know who is living in you is write this down all okay not a question really it's a statement write this down whoever lives in you will be the one wearing you like a clothes whoever lives in you will be the one doing what wearing you like a cloth. Do you understand these things? Do you remember when God manifested in Jesus and came on earth and he gathered his disciples and he gave them communion? He gave Judas holy communion and the Bible says, and Satan enters him. Satan wore him like a cloth and took him to go and betray Jesus. If the unclean lives in you, it wears you like a garment. Are you understanding me? You cannot be able to do what is right. You always do what is evil. The next question, the next statement that will help you know who lives in you is whoever lives in you will be the one to determine where you live in the spirit realm. Whoever lives in you will be the one to determine where you live in the spirit realm. So you now check your spiritual atmosphere. The Bible says in Psalm 90 that God has been our habitation in all generations. So if you are living in God in the spirit realm, you cannot live in sin. Do you understand me? So when somebody is living in sin, that person is not having Christ in him. So if you have Christ in you, you cannot live in sin. For instance, a so-called pastor, a so-called Christian cannot be comfortable living with a woman he's not married to, a man she's not married to, and you call that Christianity. You cannot live in sin if you live in God in the spirit realm. Do you understand me? So if you are living in sin and you claim to be living in God, you are lying because God is holy People who live in the Holy God, they live a holy life. So this will help you understand who live in you. Number four, that will help you understand is this. Whoever lives in you will ultimately determine where you spend eternity. Where do you go to on Sunday mornings? Do you sit at home? 
or worship in a money-making machine or spiritually dead assembly called church? Join us every Sunday. First service, 8.30 a.m. Second service, 12.30 p.m. Inside Food. Revolutionary and life-giving. Life full of the precious power of the Holy Spirit. As God's servant Richard E. Esther Kim, author of Riding on Covenant Wings, Overcoming Witchcraft by the Greatness of God's Power, and You Shall Not Be Poor, unfolds the word of truth and righteousness under the propelling force of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. Whoever lives in you will ultimately determine where you spend eternity. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 20. What the Bible says will happen at the great white throne judgment. This is where every mankind on earth, apart from those who have truly accepted Jesus, this is where they are going to end. Revelation 20 from verse 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled. Hmm. Do you see Jesus? There was no found and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were open and another book was open with the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works dead then dead and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast where? It's a lake of fire. So if Christ lives in you, your name will appear in the book of life. But if another thing lives in you, your name will not be there. So that's why I say, whoever lives in you, determine where you spend eternity. Do you understand me? And the last thing I want to share with you before we pray is this. I want to show you how life after salvation needs to be. Life after salvation decision. There are three major things you must overcome. There are three major things you must overcome. After you have made salvation decision. Or else you will end up in hell as a Christian. Three major things you must overcome on daily basis. Do you understand me? Three major things you must overcome on daily basis. So me daily basis. Every day. I didn't say every week. I didn't say every month. I didn't say every year. You must overcome them on daily basis. Number one, you must overcome the world. You must overcome the world. When we say the world, W-O-R-O-L-D, we are talking about the evil and corrupt system of this world. Do you understand me? The evil and corrupt system of this world, that is the first thing you must overcome on daily basis, or else your Christianity will not end you in heaven. Be be good, I mean, beautifully speaking, the Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What kind of faith? It's not empty faith. It's talking about the faith that has character. The faith that has character, not the faith of demons. The faith of demons is a faith that have no character. We're talking about the faith that have the character of God. Do you understand me? That is a faith that will overcome the world. If you look at that faith in the book of Hebrew, chapter 11, you see terrific men, how they rejected the world and they accepted Jesus. Some of them were sold into two. Some of them live in caves. Are you understanding me? Some of them lose, lost their jobs. Some of them lost their lives. Because of this very faith we are talking about, this is the faith that overcome the world. Is you looking at the face of Jesus and telling the devil, you cannot have me. Are you understanding me? That is the faith. Is you looking at the face of Jesus and telling lost pride, you can't have me. Are you understanding me? That is the faith. So you must overcome the world. Number two, you must overcome the flesh. On daily basis, after your salvation decision, 
If you don't overcome the flesh on daily basis, you will lose your salvation. All those crazy liars who say once saved, forever saved, they are the mortuary attendants, the spiritual mortuary attendants who are preparing men for hell, preaching the gospel that they ought not to preach. Are you understanding me? You must understand if you have given your life to Christ, you don't overcome the world, you don't overcome the flesh on daily basis. When you close your eyes, you end up in death. So look at what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, do you see it? Let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Say, I hear. Let him deny the flesh of his cravings. Let him deny himself of the carnal passions of the flesh. You cannot be satisfying your flesh and satisfy God at the same time. It don't work together. Are you understanding me? So, those people who are masturbating, what is masturbating? Masturbation is satisfying the craving of the, the sexual craving of the flesh alone without anybody with you. And some stupid people say it's not a sin. Well, let's get to heaven. Let the judge of all speak. They will know what is a sin and what is not. And good enough, he has already spoken in the world. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I remember the story we read about Lazarus and the rich man. What, did, what happened? They all went to hell. I mean, they all went to the next life. Lazarus was in heaven. The rich man was in hell. When he got to hell, for you to know that when people go to hell, they are still the same. There's no difference. It's just your body that dropped here. It's still you. You will remember the school you went everything you remember so all the senses will, there be, will be there with you in fact that that does not really diminish anything that is simply it's like removing your clothes and coming out of it so there is still life after that you get my point that's why they call it transition it's you coming out of your body you are still it's still you so the rich man was there in the grave and look at what he was telling Abraham. Oh, send Lazarus to come and give me some water. Abraham said, no, there's a big gulf. We can't cross. Though we, though we can see ourselves, but we can't cross. He said, okay, can you send him to go to the earth and tell my brothers? And what did Abraham say? He said, Moses is there. The prophets are there. What is Moses? When the Bible says Moses is there, he's talking about the first, the first five books of Moses. Hmm, what a what word a from our God. You have been listening to the cry of the Spirit today, the prophetic and apostolic ministry of Richard E. Esther King. Coming to you from the Apostolic Center of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi. For the complete package of this message, further information about the ministry, Apostle Takim's books, Riding on Covenant Wings, Overcoming Witchcraft by the Greatness of God's Power, and You Shall Not Be Poor, or More Encounters with God, call the church office on 0706-370-793, 0706-370-793. Please visit our website at www.cotsmonline.org. That is www.cotsmonline.org. You can also interact with him personally on his Facebook page, Richard E. Esther Kim Apostle. Or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Richard E. Esther Kim. Also join us every Sunday, 8.30 a.m. first service and 12.30 p.m. second service Wednesdays and Fridays 5 p.m. for our midweek apostolic fellowship and the first week of every month for our 2018 Greater Things Apostolic Summit. The venue is the Apostolic Center of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries, second floor, GMC House, number two, Kimathi Street, behind Hilton Hotel, opposite Corner House, Nairobi. Do not forget to tune in to this station next Sunday, same time. Jesus is Lord. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this.